Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Now let us draw near to the throne of grace together and pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege and a joy it is to come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our perfect mediator and advocate. Secure us, we ask you, in your love and your promises. All of us here constantly need your mercy and your grace, so help us to feel our need for you this morning. And we pray that you would make your son more glorious in our eyes and in our hearts today, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth and with reverence and delight. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I want to look at our Hebrews reading this morning and reflect on that with you. The letter was written to a group of people a lot like us in many ways. They were troubled by all kinds of spiritual questions and ambiguities. And the author, I think it was Paul, I'm pretty sure it was Paul, he goes about here giving them the answer to all their troubles, all their problems. And really what he's doing is giving the solution to every human need, to every aching heart, and that is to gain a more clear and full understanding of Jesus, the Son of God, of who he is and what he's done. Whatever's troubling you, I guarantee you, if we will talk through it just enough, I can guarantee I will get you to understanding that Jesus Christ is the answer for what you're going through. Now, it, it took me a little while to be able to get there. As a kid and as a young man, I remember my own experience growing up in church. I was, truth be told, always puzzled by the whole Jesus thing. Like, well, you, weren't you a Christian? Well, yeah, I was, but I just didn't quite understand how it all worked. It wasn't clear to me. I had, I had a pretty clear idea of God the Father. He's the one ruling all things, right? And the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to us and indwells us and draws us into the life of God and, and changes us from the inside out. I got all that. But the whole ministry and the work of Jesus seemed a little bit extra to me, a little unnecessary even. This is what I used to think. It's not what I think now. Because I was just, apart from the whole forgiveness of sins thing, I really didn't see the point of Jesus beyond that. And because Jesus wasn't clear to me, I didn't see the connection then, but I do now. My own faith in my entire life was ambiguous, was unsteady, and unhappy. And I continued to suffer until I grew into my understanding of seeing the centrality of Jesus Christ for everything in my life. And ever since it started to dawn on me by God's grace that Jesus is the center of it all, I've, I've not really gotten over that. I've just gone deeper and deeper and deeper into that by the grace of God, trying to understand Him more. And so that's what Hebrews is all about. If you remember, a couple weeks ago, we looked at Hebrews 2, where Paul is sort of building his argument and he's saying that everything in the world seems to be in chaos can you relate to that everything seems out of control and we just don't see any answers until we do what <clears throat> until we see jesus remember that he says but we see jesus the whole point of the letter the whole point of this text is to get us to pay more attention to jesus god has spoken in the prophets he says, and now he's spoken to us by sending us his son. And because he has spoken, because he sent his son, he says, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. We cannot neglect so great a salvation, he says. And the cry of Hebrews is really just consider Jesus, look to Jesus, see him, meditate on him, believe him, call out to him, draw near to him for mercy, for grace, for help in your time of need, for confidence, for hope, for life for love, all these things are only found in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Truly and permanently. And now we're getting down to the essence of the thing, now that we're in Hebrews 5. When we look to Jesus, what do we see? He tells us, don't harden your hearts if you hear him calling. Draw near to him. But what, when you draw near to him, what do you find? And if he's, and he's, if he's saving us, how does he save us? 
Here's the answer. Are you ready? Anticipation. He saves us because he has become our great high priest. That is how he saves us. And that's what this letter is largely about, this great teaching at the center of the Bible that Jesus is our high priest. And we are come to God and, and we have eternal life and we enjoy him forevermore only in and through Jesus as our priest. We've got to become more clear on this. That has to occupy a more central place in our thinking and understanding. Otherwise, we'll never be able to worship God in spirit and truth, really. We'll never really have a robust understanding of God until we understand the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And until we do, our prayers and our faith will be vague and insecure and feeble. And we will feel that our salvation and our ability to come to God is totally dependent on our ability to get right with God. First things first, I, just want, I don't want to take anything for granted this morning. What exactly is a priest? You say, well, I'm looking at one. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. No, not really. You know, this is, we don't really have priests in the old sense in our society anymore. Other places they do. But what is a priest is a representative of a group of people who stands in for the whole group to represent them to God. A pagan God or the one true God, priests are just something humans have, or they have had anyway. And that's why Jesus, as he says in the first few verses of our reading, he had to become human so that he could represent us as a priest to God. So priests mediate between a group of people and a divine power. And they, you know, they, they, they sort of keep the relationship intact. And they do this by different things. Think of pagan rituals or think of Old Testament priests in the temple working. Um, they're, they're offering sacrifices to appease the wrath of the God, whatever it is. They're making offerings to curry favor and they're offering worship and gratitude on behalf of the people, like the whole village or the kingdom or whatever it is. All this is to keep the relationship with that God going and intact and secure. And so, first things first, we need to get this out of the way. And I know this might get you to do the confused dog head tilt, the huh? <laughs> kind of a thing. But we've got to start by making it clear. And here's number one on our outline. I am not a priest. You're like, come again? <laughs> I'm not a priest in this sense. I know I'm called a priest. I'm dressed like a priest. I do priestly looking things as I stand before you, especially at the altar. But I am most definitely not a real priest. So what am I, a fraud, an imposter? Am I just, did I just lie to get my way into this job? <laughs> in this ministry to you? No, I'm ordained, but I'm not really a priest. Not in this classic sense. I'm an elder in the New Testament terms. That's what I'm ordained as. I'm an elder. In the Greek, it's presbyter. I'm authorized to proclaim the word of God and administer the sacraments and rule over a congregation. But I am not, properly and truly speaking, a priest. Priest is something like a nickname. They gave elders in the church way back, a long time ago in ancient times, and it's a bit of a shorthand for what people like me represent to you, sacramentally, sort of symbolically. I don't mediate between you and God, all right? That's not my role. I, I, I simply dress up like a priest, and I play the part of a priest up here to remind you of the fact that we have one true high priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and I ain't him, if you haven't noticed. Right? I'm like a big post-it note picture of a priest to remind you. you know, I'm something that you can see with your eyes, but really my whole dressing like this and everything just points you to the priest who is invisible to us because he ascended to the heavens and now sits at the right hand of God. We can't see him there. And so I dress up like a priest to remind you that he is there at the right hand of God, interceding for you perpetually. Does that make sense? And this, this title of, of priest for elders gained such prominence over time because those who were ordained started to enjoy it a little too much. 
the title and, and the, 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 the sort of nickname, and they started to insist that they were essential middlemen. You know, you can't come to the Father except, or to Jesus except you go through me. That's awfully convenient for people who want to make money and be popular, isn't it? Right? No, they started to insist that they were the essential middlemen. And the Roman church is built exactly on that. That is the foundation of that whole enterprise. But mediating between you and God is not my ministry, and it ain't theirs either. You are supposed to go to Jesus Christ yourself. I'm just here to remind you of that. And if you ever want to break my heart, make me cry. <laughs> Tell me things like I hear from time to time, right? Oh, I, I don't pray all that much. That's what I've got you for, Jeremy. I'm going to like throw my pulpit. <laughs> if I hear somebody say that one more time. <laughs> or you say, oh, I don't read my Bible all that much. I'll just depend on you to tell me what it says. It's garbage. Or, hey, uh, why don't you put in a good word for me with the man upstairs? I hear that trash all the time. And it breaks my heart. I don't do all this so I can put in a good word for you. I do this so you can go to him yourself. All these kinds of symptoms, that is pagan blasphemy. It is profoundly unchristian. It is a denial of the saving work of Jesus Christ. So I hope it's clear by now, I am not a priest, all right? But, but there's good news this morning. You don't need a religious priest in your life, Christian, because here's number two in their outline. You have a priest. It ain't me. It's him. Just before our reading, if you hope you got your Bibles with you, you can just look at it for a moment or open your app up to look at Hebrews 5. And if you scroll back a little bit into Hebrews 4, you'll see in verse 14, this is what he says. The apostle says, says, We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And again, this is why Jesus became human, so he could re represent you and me who are humans, to God the Father and mediate for us as one of us. It's really simple and it's wonderful to think that that perfect man is up there right now interceding for you and me. He's keeping the relationship with the Father alive and intact. He is our only and vital link with God the Father. Is that one man, Jesus Christ. And now here the apostle tells us some things about Jesus as our high priest. This is back in Hebrews 5, starting at verse 5. We, hear, we see, just for the sake of the outline, because we're in number 2, letter A under number 2 is, he is a, his priesthood is established by the Father. It is established by the Father. He says, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, etc. He was appointed by God, and that's why he's there. God the Father decreed this. And yes, the wrath of God burns against sin and against the unrepentant, but it doesn't burn against those who are in Jesus Christ. For the Christian, it's not like the Father's perpetually angry at us and Jesus has to hold it back. He's like, oh, I'm going to go get him. Or I'm gonna get... And Jesus is like, no, Dad, no, you said you promised you wouldn't. It's not how it is. Right? He's not holding it back. No, the Father set this whole thing up because he loves you and me. That's why he gave us a high priest. That's why he gave his own son to do this. Right? He appointed him to it because he knew those who were his. And he knew that we were utterly ruined by sin. And, and out of his great desire to have us with him, out of his love, he sent his only son to bear our guilt and to destroy our guilt. And give us his righteousness in return so that we could stand before him as his beloved children. And so even though we're not at all perfect just yet, we will be one day in Christ, but not yet are we there. Even though we're not perfect, we do have the ability and to stand, the right to stand before God because the perfect man, Jesus Christ, is our representative and we're spiritually united to him. And it was the Father who set all this how great is this love for us? That he would make all these arrangements. It was established by the Father. That's letter A. And then he directs our attention now to Jesus himself. The apostle does. And he notes how in every aspect of his life, especially in his suffering, and here's number B. He, Jesus looked 
only to God for his help. He looked only to God for help. He didn't look to men. He didn't look to himself. He looked to God. He just threw himself on the love and the mercy and the plan of God. Verse 7, he says this. He says, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Not to anyone else, but only to the Father. Right? He looked to his heavenly Father and to him alone. Only God could save him from death. Only God can raise him from the dead. Just, we're meant to be thinking of him, especially in Gethsemane, right? Right before he went to the cross. And he's, he's facing the fearsome prospect of taking on the sin of the world and dying a gruesome death. And what did he do? Did he call out to Peter and say, hey, Peter, I'm going through a really hard time, man. I just need you to come alongside me. I need to lean on you for a while. Come sit with me. I'm upset. You know, I need a shoulder to cry on. Did he say any of that stuff? No, let me lean on you, Peter. I'm having a heart. No. He let those jokers sleep. He left them all behind, and he went and he leaned on God and God alone. And it's a good thing he leaned only on God because I constantly give in to the temptation to lean on others or even stuff. Do you ever lean on stuff for your... Do you ever lean, trust in people rather than trusting in God? I mean, I, I think we admitted all this last week with the story of the rich young ruler. Um, you know, we, family, friends, career, money, food... We look to these things to feel secure and to feel alive. But beloved, there is only one who can save you from death, and it ain't your paycheck. It ain't even your doctor, right? There's only one you can lean on. There's only one foundation for your soul, and that is our high priest, Jesus Christ. There's only, because he's the only one who cried out to God alone. He's the only one who did. He's the only one that can save because he cried out only to God. And because he cried out only to God, he put all of his eggs in that basket. He put all of his trust in him. That's why we have a sure resting place in Jesus. Where you can not only lean on him, you can like lay down and take a nap in him, spiritually speaking. You can just completely rest and trust that your high priest has your future all buttoned down and secured in the purposes and the plan of God and his kingdom. So he, Jesus only looked to God for his help. And we also learn here as we keep going let her see that he was perfectly reverent. He was perfectly reverent. It says this in verse 7. He was heard because of his reverence. God heard him because of his reverent spirit. And it's, it's like, at last, we have someone who truly gives God the respect he deserves and, and puts all of his hope in him. At last, someone who's who perfectly worships God, a human being, right? Who loves the Lord, as God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, and all his strength. We didn't have that. Nobody on earth was like that until Jesus came along. And he worshiped God perfectly. He honored his father perfectly. And this is why he was counted as worthy. This is why he is acceptable as a high priest, because of his perfection. And this is why God heard him. You and I, we are not worthy in and of ourselves. Not once have we ever loved the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, right? All our mind or all our strength. Yet because this one man was perfectly reverent and because he represents us to the Father, we can come into the presence of God as compromised and constantly wavering as we are we have every confidence that we belong there, that we are wanted, that we have the right to go there because we have this high priest seated at the right hand of God. Your ability to be there has nothing to do, really, with your behavior or your reverence. You sort of working it up to get yourself in shape so you can go to the presence of God. It's only because Jesus was reverent that you can go into the presence of God. It's only because he hears your prayers as a loving father is because Jesus was heard because of his reverence. And he now stands there for you, reverently praying for you and for me right this second. He never stops. And then we see another crucial aspect of why he's a perfect high priest. We've got to keep going. 
He was, letter D, perfectly obedient. That's what he says in verse 8. He says he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, what is he saying here? Jesus was disobedient before? No, as the divine son of God, he'd never been anything but obedient and at one with the Father, perfectly united in will. But rather, this, what he means here is that he had to experience full obedience as a human, even unto death. And he had to learn, he had to experience what it was like. And, and then in so doing, we learn what it looks like too because he experienced it. Does that make sense? He had to learn what it's like to be a human and to be, he had to personally experience it. So he truly is one of us. And it's like at last, there's finally a man who doesn't say no to God. <laughs> finally, someone who doesn't ignore God or think he's more important than God. And someone who doesn't think he could do it better than God, but he came to enact and establish the will of God. For you, who could never do these things, and for me. And he did all this because he wanted to please and glorify God. That is why you can go to God in prayer. That is why you can approach him having the hope of heaven, everlasting life in God's kingdom. You don't get to come to him because you're good. You get to go to the Father because Jesus is good. And in his love, he's decided that you're with him. And you get to ride in his coattails of his goodness. He's got really big coattails. And all of this adds up to him. I'm sort of running out of words here. Being perfectly perfect. That's letter E. It's just the abundance, the superfluity of perfection. Verse 9 it says, being made perfect. Right, we're going to just stop there. By that, he means perfect in his humanity. As the Son of God, he was perfect in his divine nature. But in his human nature, he was perfected and completed as a flawless sacrifice for sin. He was already perfect as God, but his human nature needed to grow into and experience obedience and reverence and deny temptation. He needed to constantly die to sin and live unto God. And this makes him the perfect fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrificial lamb. All those perfect little lambs that were sacrificed for the sin of the people. They're all pointed to this one great sacrifice. Spotless and perfect. He was the perfect satisfaction for sin. He, his perfect obedience and love for the Father. All added into this. And this made him a perfect and glorified risen man after, at Easter. And so what Adam failed to be, what I failed to be, what you failed to be, Jesus actually is. And he is glorious beyond compare. He is perfectly perfect. I could add more perfectly, 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 perfect. Because there are no words to describe. He is glorious beyond compare. Our risen and ascended Lord. He is pleasing to the Father. And God is satisfied in him. And so this is why he's able to stand between us and the wrath of Almighty God. He brings forgiveness and reconciliation with the Father. And, and, but just as importantly, he continuously links us to the life and the love of Almighty God. It's this living, ongoing link. It, he must be risen again and, and living forevermore. Ne death never to touch him again. If our salvation is to continue intact, if we're to continually be receiving the righteousness of Christ, his, his love and his mercy and his grace, that requires a living Savior to constantly give it and to maintain that act alive. Right? And keep it going. And because he is perfect in every way, finally we see letter F, as it says, being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He is the source of eternal salvation. All, the source of it, right? It all goes through him like a pipe, like a conduit, or like a wire. It's your data connection, if you will, for you IT guys out there, or gals, Right? That was for you, Brianna, the gal. <laughs> all the grace and the mercy and the glory and the life and the joy and the peace and the power, all, all from God, it all flows through that one link, Jesus Christ, the high priest. If it were not for that link, you would not get it. 
This is the only way it comes. But if you are with him, you're set. There's no breaking the link once it's made. You're plugged in forever. How, how do we, I was thinking of how to think of this, and um, it's kind of like, uh, let's say it's our time to go to heaven, right? And our souls go up there, and there's the angel at the door, at the gates. You know, the jokes say St. Peter. Don't worry about that. It's Roman Catholic. Uh, no, we got, let's, let's say there's an angel there, and he's guarding the entrance. And he looks, looks, looks you up and down or looks me up and down and says, eh, only the perfect get in here. You, you, don't, you don't belong here, I'm sorry. And then Jesus, he's like the celebrity that says, oh, no, no, this one's with me. Oh, why didn't you say so? Come right on in, right? Come on in. Oh, they're with you. All right, that's a totally different thing. This is kind of how it works. It's a really crude image of how it works. If we're with him, he's the perfect one. He's the glorious, famous one. He's the one that all the angels adore, right? And if Jesus says you're with him and that you're the recipient of his love, you get to go in. You get to enter in. And the whole lot of his people are with him. That's why earlier in chapter 2, he quotes Isaiah 8. And he says to the Father, he says, Behold, I and the children whom you have given me. As I've brought them all. They're all with me. They're all with me. They're all riding on my coattails. Here we are. I and the children you've given me. Look, Father, look what I've done. I've brought them all just like we designed. They're now with me, and here they are. Look what I've won for you. And the Father looks at his son, and he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. My beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I live to hear those words. Son number three, and we'll wrap it up with this. Earlier in Hebrews, he said, we must not neglect this salvation. And I'm like, once you really see what he's presenting to you and, and who Jesus is as our high priest. The, the question, should, maybe in my mind, is like, who, who would neglect this? And yet we do all the time, don't we? Why would we neglect this? Well, because we're fools and we forget all these things. We don't keep them in mind. They're not at the center of our thinking. Every day when I enter into prayer I have to think of Jesus as my high priest if I'm going to get my head and heart straight for the day I have to resituate and orient myself I have to remember there is a man in heaven right now pleading for me giving me his righteousness linking me eternally to the glory and the grace of God I have that right now if I don't do that my day is garbage but if I do that I remember and I settle in and I rest in him. But if we forget that, we just fall back on our old pagan habits, which sadly comes super, not, not supernaturally, but totally naturally to us. All right? I, I've been like this in the past, and sometimes I still am like this, I think. You know, and I think some of you are too. You know, you, you've just messed up. You've just stepped in something, right? You've just opened your stupid mouth again and said whatever, right? Or you've gone wherever, or done whatever, and looked at whatever, whatever it is. You've committed some sin, or maybe you just feel that your heart isn't in the right place to approach God. You're like, oh, I can't pray now. I'm not going to get into the Word now. I just don't feel like it. I don't, I don't it, you know, I'm feeling cold and distant, or I've just messed up. He doesn't want to see me, and you're reluctant to approach God in prayer. You're forgetting that you have a high priest, perfect in the heavens. Or maybe you think you're not very good at praying because you don't sound like the, the prayer book official prayers or you don't sound like that some, that some beloved sweet Christian brother or sister who's so good at prayer. And, and you're sort of embarrassed by the simplicity of your expression and you don't know exactly what to say and you think, well, surely God, he's not interested in my prayer. He doesn't want to bother with me. You forget that you have a perfect high priest in the heavens right now praying for you 
and he sends his spirit, right? To utter groans too deep for words. He just, it's, you're being caught up into the presence of God and the fellowship of God through the work of the Son and the Spirit, right? And, and when we act this way, we're acting like pagans. Oh, he doesn't want to see me right now. Are you kidding me? He died so you could go into his presence. He knew you weren't capable of it. That's why he did it. We're denying the grace of God when we act like that. And we forget the fact that our great high priest is standing there right now, perfectly perfect, perfectly interceding for you. He's got it covered. None of these things prevent you from coming to the Father to enjoy your vital link with God. No imperfection in you. No wrong state of heart or mind. Just go. Believe that there is a perfect high priest right there, active and living right now, mediating for you, and go into his presence. The only thing that's crucial is that you want to go. You want to go into his presence, and that you are trusting that Jesus is already there in perfect purity and perfect reverence and perfect attention on the Father and doing all the things you could never do and being all the things you could never be. And he's there right now, and he's calling to you. He's calling you to say, come, I love you. Come unto me. I, I love you. You're precious to me. Look at what it cost me to buy you. So come. Enjoy. Just let your soul delight. Just feast in my presence. And know the love and the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you right now trusting in nothing but Jesus, our high priest. We ask that you would make this clear in our hearts and our minds. Just grace upon grace upon grace upon grace constantly flowing through our great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. And this is why we can come to you. This is why we should want to come to you. So Lord, draw us to yourself that we would come we would know you, have eternal life, and be so richly blessed by you. I ask these things in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen.